50 years since the first HIV-related death, scientists have eliminated the virus in a group of mice, and two people seem to have overcome it after treatment. Are we finally closer to a cure? Welcome to Round Table. Hello, I'm Martin Stanford. For those who are infected by HIV, drugs can certainly help to keep it under control. Now researchers claim they've eliminated the virus in mice, and two patients who've become HIV-free are raising new interest and new hope. It has been half a century since the first known HIV-related death took place. Since then, two patients known as the Berlin and the London patients have been effectively cured of the disease. Both patients became virus-free after a bone marrow transplant, raising hope of a cure for HIV. According to UN AIDS, there were approximately 36.9 million people worldwide living with HIV and AIDS in 2017. In 2018, there were 1.8 million children under the age of 15 living with HIV. HIV treatment access is the key to the global effort to end AIDS as a public health threat. But the stigma around the issue is preventing many people from taking up medication. So how close are we to a viable, affordable cure to HIV and AIDS? Joining us on Roundtable today is Angelina Nabiba, HIV activist and project manager at Salamander Trust. John Freiter is professor of infectious diseases at Oxford University and an HIV clinician. Saoirse Fitzpatrick is Advocacy Manager at Stop AIDS. And joining us from Geneva, Peter Godfrey Fawcett, UN AIDS Senior Science Advisor. Welcome to you all. Thank you very much indeed for being here. John, see if you can define for us what a cure for HIV would look like. OK, so let's start right at the beginning with some very sort of fundamental concepts here. A cure, for, I mean, the word cure is so emotive anyway, and I think there's so much responsibility on, you know, the research community and the clinical community to, to make sure that people understand exactly what it is we're talking about and how realistic this is as we move forward. I think the sort of the, the fundamental thought of a cure is when you get rid of a bug in terms of an infection. So, you know, if you're cured of flu, the flu has gone from your body. If you're cured from a different virus, that has gone from your body. And in terms of HIV, the ultimate that we're looking for is a cure that would mean that every last virus, every last remnant of that virus has been removed from the person's body who's living with that. And that is the ultimate goal. And one might refer to that as something like a sterilising cure. And that is kind of the ultimate aim. In order to get there, there might be a halfway house. And that is a sort of a concept of remission. And this is the idea that someone living with HIV who has been taking tablets for many, many years to suppress that virus, but without getting rid of it, but allowing them to stay well, could then stop taking those tablets and remain well. And even though the virus is still there in the body at very low levels, it is not doing harm anymore, and that person doesn't need to take medication. So are we any closer to moving from treatment, everyday pill-taking, to an inoculation, a one-off shot or something similar? which kills the phenomenon stone dead. So that's another way of looking at it. One idea is we get rid of HIV and you go into remission. The other is can we change the way we give therapy so you could have a shot in the arm every six months, you don't have to take tablets every day, and then that means you'd be under much greater control. There are a lot of really exciting trials going on at the moment. There are drug formulations which can be given. There are injections at the moment, and they don't quite last as long as really you would want them to last, but it is certainly fantastic steps in the right direction. More cutting edge, there's some amazing new technologies coming forward called broadly neutralizing antibodies, and they're sort of an immunotherapy. And it looks like some of those after an injection might be effective for around six months. Now, they've not formally been trialed in humans yet, but they're a very exciting alternative. Let me bring Peter Godfrey Fawcett then, joining us from Geneva. Is it the case, though, that the real excitement and advances are just in the wealthy West and that for other parts of the world trying to deal with HIV and AIDS, the situation looks very different? Yes and no. I think that the extraordinary facts of the HIV epidemic are that we've made massive progress 
both in the rich world and in the poor world. Um, the fact that we've scaled up treatment with antiretroviral drugs so that now more than 23 million people are taking antiretroviral drugs. And as, as John mentioned, these pills keep the virus under control. Not only do people live full, healthy, productive, hopefully happy lives, but also equally importantly, it, it leads to people being non-infectious. So people taking the tablets, if they're taking them properly, don't pass on the virus. So we've come an enormous way from, from the days of, of HIV being a death sentence. Nonetheless, we do still have 770,000 people dying of HIV each year. And you're right that most of those are in the poorer parts of the world. And the reasons that people are dying is because people are not always able to access testing, treatment, and the support needed to remain on treatment. And that is the absolute priority, that we need to get people tested, put them on treatment, and support people to be able to remain on treatment. Angelina, let me bring you in here, because it is an astonishing fact that in some parts of the world, treatment is available, but is refused because of a sense of shame or a sense of stigma. Why is that still the case, do you think? Well, you know, it's, there's lots of reasons. I mean, stigma, unfortunately, we still don't have a cure for stigma. And we know that stigma is what's really killing communities because stigma prevents people from testing for HIV. It prevents people from accessing treatment. It also prevents people from staying engaged in the health and social care services that keep them alive. Now, the, the thing is, stigma is so wide. It, it affects individuals in different ways. You know, it affects people at an individual level. So how you think about yourself, how you think about HIV, and that can turn into self-stigma itself because if all you've ever had before your diagnosis is um, negative stuff, then that's what kind of some people take on board. But also, even if you're not worried about stigma, people experience stigma in families, in communities. People also experience stigma in organizations, so, you know, in workplaces, in schools, you know, in uh, places of worship. And also in society. So, for example, even to, up to now, you'll see a lot of times, even the media itself often portrays HIV or us people living with HIV as really bad people. But actually, we are not. And so when it's all around negativity, people don't even want to be associated. And I think you mentioned the fact that people are not accessing. It's also about to do with access and whether you're able, even, even if it's available in a country, you need to think about people who may live in very rural areas and whether they have the ability to access the treatment center. So there's lots of reason, intertwining reasons why people don't access treatment. No, I thought it was telling that in, in some cases, even where there maybe is a medical center and there's a doctor and there's a practitioner, yeah. that um, patients maybe will receive some drugs and say, please, you know, take one of those every day and things will be better. But yeah. they just throw the drugs away. And that's an education program, is it? And it's a societal change that needs to come about. There's a lot that needs to happen because once we start getting away from the moralizing and the judging, because that's what really it's about. And the thing is, the reality is HIV is a virus. It's not, you know, it's not a moral issue. It doesn't define who we are. But the thing is, people also take on board very much what society thinks. And if society thinks this is a bad thing, the label is a bad human being, you don't want to be associated. But also, there's a lot of people express a lot of mental health issues. So it's not just simple to say that, OK, take the treatment, you'll be fine, because it's not all about that, about a good quality of life. Mm -hmm. And so there's lots more that's involved in terms of supporting people to live well, to understand the importance of taking treatment, to have the confidence to not buy in to people you know, treating you badly or stigmatizing against you because at the end of the day, this treatment is what is there to help your life. So you need to have a lot more education, a lot more awareness, also starting from the individual level. Uh, and do you feel that you've suffered prejudice or misunderstanding as if, you, uh, if and when you tell people you're HIV? I personally feel I haven't, and if I have, I haven't noticed it, but I think it's because of the kind of outlook I have on life. Um, I've been diagnosed for over 20 years now, and initially it was very challenging for me, and I find it very hard to share my status with other people. If I tell somebody I live with HIV and they don't like it, I think about the fact that actually, do you pay my rent? Do you feed me? Do you clothe me? So if you don't like me just because I have a virus, then actually I don't need you in my life. But I'm very aware of the fact that I can do that because I'm able to do that. Because at the end of the day, if someone says I don't like you because you have HIV, I have a home to go to. But there are many more women and other people living with HIV who are emotionally and economically dependent on others. So for them, telling somebody they have HIV, they could be ostracized, they could be thrown out it of their homes. It could be a big moment. Yes. Uh, so should you, do you find this in your advocacy that there's still 
this stigma to overcome around this whole area of HIV and AIDS? Yeah, definitely. I think considering particularly because 50% of new infections are in what we call key populations, so most at risk groups, and these are criminalized populations, so men who have sex with men, uh, transgender people, uh, people who inject drugs and sex workers. So in many countries, there are legal barriers that mm. prevent people from accessing the prevention, treatment and care services that they need. And that underpins the stigma then that is pre There's prevalent in There's a temptation to moralise, isn't it? That in some sense, these patients have brought it on themselves by their behaviour. I mean, or there's their lifestyle choices. Sometimes, yeah, that argument has definitely been used. I mean, we saw that throughout the 80s, you know, yeah. in, in the US. Is it a tired US. argument or is it still relevant today, do you think? No, I, it's, it's definitely still relevant. I mean, there have been um, amazing um, uh, case studies of progress where the LGBTI community has managed to um, annul those criminalizing laws in, in many countries in sub Saharan Africa and Asia and Latin America. But it's still a big issue. Um, because those services that those people need, they need to be designed and delivered by those people themselves. They know what their unique needs are. Um, so the community response within the broader HIV response is vital. Peter, can I just ask you to explain a bit more about the, how we attack this thing that is HIV? Um, gene editing is a, a relatively new area of medical science, yet it's relevant in this context. Can you explain why? There have been amazing steps forwards in gene editing, in, in our ability to specifically target sequences of DNA, um, the, the genetic code, and then in precise places cut them in order to, to chop out that particular bit of gene or whatever. So this opens up all sorts of possibilities in all sorts of areas of science, and, and it's becoming a, a major um, growth area in science in general. Mm. The first sort of controversial use was when um, a scientist took embryos and used gene editing to cut out the receptor through which HIV binds. So that as those embryos developed into babies, the idea is that they would no longer have those receptors, so HIV wouldn't be able to bind, and in principle, they would be protected from HIV. And this is, in fact, similar to the two cure patients that you mentioned in the beginning, the um, Timothy Ray Brown, the Berlin patient, and, and the, the more recent London patient, both of whom had horrendous diseases on top of their HIV, um, blood cancers, that meant that they ended up having to have bone marrow transplants for their blood cancer, not for the HIV. But as a result, they were given bone marrow transplants from donors who already had mutations in these receptor genes. And that makes their cells harder to infect with HIV and therefore harder to sustain an HIV infection. And so in both those cases, when the antiretroviral treatment was stopped, they remained well because HIV was no longer able to keep going. And, and Timothy Ray Brown, that's now been for a long time, the London patient for slightly less time. An alternative approach with gene editing that I think is perhaps more exciting is rather than trying to change the, the receptors in a human, it's to use those same gene editing tools to actually cut out the, the virus that is lurking in so-called reservoir cells in the body. So scientists in the US, um, Temple University, have recently developed a system whereby the, the, the gene editing tool is carried in a, a harmless virus. And that harmless virus penetrates the entire body and gets into cells. And that liberates this gene editing tool in the cells of the body. And the gene editing tool finds and targets the actual HIV virus lurking in those cells and cuts it out. Mm. And they've done this now in a monkey, which was presented earlier this year. The monkey was still on antiretroviral treatment, but they couldn't find any virus at all when that monkey was sacrificed in any of the tissues of the monkey. And most recently, as you commented in your introductory um, text, it's been done in some mice and two out of uh, several mice, so not, not all the mice were cured, but in a couple of the mice who had this approach, two of them, 
the mice remained entirely well, and when the poor mice were sacrificed, they were chopped up and they tried to infect other mice with them, and they were unable to infect other mice. So it really seemed that these two mice, about a third of the mice they tried it in, were cured. Yeah. The reason this is particularly exciting is that essentially, if this developed, it, the treatment was really a one-off infusion of this virus carrying the gene editing tool. And so some way in the future, and after many trials that need to be done to prove that it's really safe and tests in humans, et cetera, et cetera, it could lead to an approach that was a sort of a one-off, as you were saying, a one-off shot that okay. might be able to cure HIV. Let me just bring in John at this point, because um, without wanting to be sensationalist, this is getting close to the whole argument around designer babies. I mean, if you medical clinicians can go in and protect an embryo, protect a baby before it's born from being HIV positive, you can also make sure it's got blue eyes and is good at math, right? Yeah, I mean, this is... You could. This is a very sensitive area. So and I think eth the ethics of this is... Yeah, are I think the reality questions. is, if, if something sounds too good to be true, it probably, probably is. is. And, you know, the data we've just heard, you know, they are potentially very exciting. But there is such a huge leap from curing a mouse or curing another animal and taking that through into humans. And the complexity of that cannot be underestimated. And we, there are plenty of animals that have been cured of HIV over time. You know, we still don't have a cure. Right. So, yes, it is exciting technology. And I think what we are looking at actually is a real parallel with what's going on in the cancer field. And we're learning a lot from cancer because... Essentially, but once, we have to be patient. Is we what have your to be your patient. message is we have to be oh, patient. Completely. It completely. is not tomorrow. We haven't cured cancer. And no. if we haven't cured cancer, we haven't cured HIV in some ways, because it is okay. the same problem. You're trying to get rid of a bad gene. You know, HIV puts its genes into our own DNA. And so essentially, we're trying to get rid of a bad gene now, not a virus. That's not going to be and a quick that fix. Is a different problem. I was interested that in your, in your work, you talk about the psychology help you offer to patients as well as they as they live with HIV or or learn to use their medication and so on. Um, is the mental health of patients a big issue for you even today, even in UK? Oh, look, it's enormous, and, and, and we cannot underestimate. We've we've already touched on it, but this is still a global problem. I've, in my clinic. I've started saying to people who I see patients every six months on average and I've started saying since you last saw me six months ago who else have you talked to about your HIV and a huge proportion say nobody they right. will not discuss it I have mums who have not told their children people who have not told their partners yet because they're too scared of what will happen in their relationships many people will not tell their friends there is a huge stigma around this. And we are spinning so many plates in the HIV field. You know, one end of the spectrum is cure, getting therapy to everyone, dealing with stigma. They all come together in the end, actually. You know, and they, will, they can all be solved together with one sort of massive global effort. But yeah, stigma is still a huge issue, and it really shouldn't be. The one encouraging thing from my point of view, you asked if it was a tired argument. I think generations coming through, younger generations coming through, are far more tolerant. I think there is an issue around people of, of, of my age and a bit older mm. who still hold this idea of blame and bad AIDS and all this sort of thing. I think if you talk to the younger people coming through, they are so much more open with their opinions. And I've got a lot of hope, actually, that that's going to make a difference. Well, Angelina, you work in the advocacy space. Would you agree with that, that actually if you talk to one generation, they're more receptive to your message than maybe older people? Yeah, I, I agree with John, and I think, there's, as you're saying, there's so, ma so much that we need to do around stigma because it's such it's a crucial point in terms of addressing the issue around HIV. And I think there are lots of things that we can do to start to address it. Can I talk about maybe three or so? Yeah. So I think one of the first things we need to do is to change the language that we use around HIV because the language that we use already can be stigmatizing. You know, we know language has, you know, can impact on how we think, feel, act, and react, and on how we describe people. So if I use a few terms, maybe even now, we know things like, we talk about HIV-infected people, mm. HIV-positive people. You know, we, we as advocates prefer to use the term people living with HIV, because then that, and you do that, you're putting the individual, the human being, before the virus. There's, you know, one term that is used a lot is zero, zero discordant couples. And uh, all you're trying to say is one person is living with HIV and the other one is not in this relationship. There's and what's the term you use? 
So the term we would prefer to use is zero different, because that's all you're saying. They're different, they have different HIV status. Right. Mother to child transmission itself places the onus and responsibility on the mother. So, and even the, the, the language that we use about around the cure strategies in itself can be quite stigmatizing. So you tend to talk about cure, shock, and kill strategies. Mm -hmm. That in itself is very militaristic. So, you know, we need to change the language that we use because it has such a huge impact. What would your preferred terms be around that then? Ending. Just ending end HIV. Working ending. towards ending HIV. Yeah. So two other things we can actually, I think, is really important to have the visibility of people living with HIV out there because what we need society to see is actually that people living with HIV are just like you and me. You know, we're your mothers, your sisters, your brothers, we're taxpayers. You know, we, we're not, we don't look any different to anybody else. I mean, if you'd seen me, walking down the streets, you know that I had HIV. So we need to get that message out there that things have changed from the 80s to now. It's a very different. And the final thing I think is important to do is to, we need to start spreading facts and not fear about HIV. You know, we've come such a long way, and that's already been touched on, the fact that we moved a long way in terms of where treatment is at. We have a wonderful, a great, a great powerful tool and message, which is called U equals U, which if got to you mentioned, which stands for undetectable equals and untransmittable. Yes. So basically, somebody who achieves and maintains an undetectable viral load cannot pass HIV on to a past sexual partner or an unborn child. So it's important that we pass that message on. It is, in itself alone, is not going to tackle stigma, but actually, if it's delivered alongside another strategic and more um, options for treatment, etc., it actually has the potential to go a long way. So we need to be doing things slightly different. As you practice your advocacy, Sersha, do you find um, you're trying to meet fear or is it now indifference? That maybe people don't really understand the subject. They perhaps know they shouldn't be critical, but they're a bit indifferent because it doesn't directly affect them. Yeah, I think the good news story about the end of AIDS has been told too much. Um, and that has had... Well, an prematurely, you think? Yeah. Definitely prematurely. We are, we are seeing progress globally. Um, but that progress is happening by a smaller margin every year. And also those global stats hide lots of regional inequalities. You know, mm -hmm. things are improving in Eastern Southern Africa, for instance, but actually infection rates and AIDS-related death rates are increasing in Eastern Europe, in Central Asia, in the Middle East, in North Africa, in Latin America. Um, so often what, when we're doing our advocacy and we're trying to um, build awareness amongst uh, UK politicians predominantly, it's more that people think it's not a problem anymore. They think that, you know, we've, we, yeah. we've tackled this. Like You've done all that. Yeah, you know, <laughs> if you have access to treatment, then you, yeah. you, you can, you know, li live a normal life. But it's not as simple as that, as Angelina is saying. Um, you know, so in that sense, uh, just to be slightly perverse about it, the, the stories of cures or rumours of cures or newspaper mm. articles about it doesn't actually help your cause, does it? Because it... So, it gives the impression that maybe we're a lot closer to the solution we discussed yeah. than we really are. Exactly. Like, you know, it's a great story and, and it, it's definitely exciting, like the potential that is there. Yeah. And you and AIDS have said that, you know, we won't um, reach the 2030 goal of ending AIDS as a public health threat without a cure, without a vaccine. Mm. But we can't take our eye off the ball. You know, this is an epidemic mm. we're living now. We need to be protecting people who are at risk and we need to be supporting people that are living with HIV. Let me look at the global scale. Peter, as you and your colleagues at the UN side of this work, is it difficult getting funding? Is it difficult getting attitudes to focus on this? There is a complacency that has been coming in. And this is the first year, in fact, that we've seen the actual resources spent on HIV go down a bit in our, in our annual report. We, we quote the figures. Um, so I think there is a, a very big danger of becoming complacent. I think the story for the, the UK politicians that, that Saoirse is talking to and so on is that not only is there a big problem, but that we're really doing something about it and that if we continue to invest, we can make further progress. We know that we have to challenge the stigma. We have to reach out to people in their communities. I very much follow up on the point that now our latest report suggests that 54%, more than half, of all new infections are occurring in these so-called key populations, the most vulnerable populations and their sexual partners. So that's gay men and other men who have sex with men, female sex workers, people who inject drugs, transgender people, and incarcerated populations and their, and their sexual partners. And of course, those are the very people who find it hardest to engage with 
the services in their countries, particularly if you live in a country where many of those populations are actually criminalised and discriminated in the most horrible ways. And that must be, I would have thought, John, as somebody who has this clinic day by day, so frustrating. The fix is there. It's sitting in a bottle of pills, uh, and yet so few people either in the UK, in Western Europe, or in Sub-Saharan Africa, are able to avail themselves of it for one reason or another. Well, this is the disparity, and I think this is exactly what Peter was leading to. And I think the thing we have to sort of completely grasp is that HIV is going to be with us for centuries. This is not going away. And all this talk about, you know, we're making progress does not mean it is leaving the arena of things we need to worry about and deal with. So, yes, therapy is available and getting it to everyone is going to be critical. You know, the figures, and I think it's around globally, only about 60% of people who could have therapy are getting therapy. And that is a crucial, crucial problem of getting therapy to everyone that needs it. And I think it's going to be really intractable to solve that. There's no obvious way of getting it to everybody. It's a solemn thought on which to end. Thank you all to my guests. Remember, you can see more discussion and debate on our YouTube channel. Search for TRT World Roundtable. But for now, from me and all the team here, goodbye and thank you for watching.